Okay, students, let's go ahead and talk about aqueous equilibria. Okay, so the last time we talked about, we were looking at different applications of uh, solubility equilibria, right? We talked about how when a substance is slightly soluble or what we normally call insoluble, it's actually forming a saturated solution with a little bit of the dissolved ions in there. And the equilibrium of saturation is described by a constant called KSP, solubility product. So we did several analyses. For example, we calculated, you know, if I mix this with that, am I gonna get a precipitation reaction? We also talked about if I add a precipitating reagent to this mixture, which ion is gonna precipitate first? We also talked about how <clears throat> in uh, some cases, you can modify the solubility either by adding a, another salt, a common ion, to decrease solubility, or in the case of uh, substances that are susceptible to pH, we can increase the solubility by changing the pH, right? Uh, and then we were gonna talk about uh, other ways of increasing solubility, and that's where we ran out of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring us back here to where our PAR point was at. And uh, this is where we left off last time, right? And hold on a second. I'm trying to get this thing to work, but nothing's working here. So here's an exercise I want us to do, all right? If we add 2.0 milliliters of 0.6 molar ammonia to one liter of 0 0.001 molar zinc nitrate, Will a precipitate form? And I think I have a kind of like a copy of it over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring it over here to the side and we're gonna work on this over here. Can everybody see that? It's a little small. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit into it. There you go. And sorry, this is a, a different, uh, this is a copy of my own uh, PowerPoint slide, which I had to fix, like you can see here, project on whiteboard and solve manually. Uh, <laughs> that's me, that's my notes to myself. Okay. So here's the thing. What is it that we're looking for here? What does NH3 do when you put it in water? It's a base, right? So NH3, when you put it in water, it's going to produce ammonium ions and hydroxide ions. Well, that means that in this solution, you are gonna have the following ions. We have ammonium, hydroxide ions, we have ammonia, we have zinc ions, and I'm pretty sure, I thought zinc was a plus two ion. You know what, this is incorrect here. This should be N32 here. Please correct that. Zinc ions and nitrate ions. And the question is, which of those combinations would give you a precipitate? Well, the only one, <clears throat> is the combination of zinc and hydroxide. How do you know that? Because you would have a solubility table, and by the way, I'm gonna give you one in the test, so you can use it. So this is what we're thinking that could happen. That is our candidate, right? And that would have an equilibrium with zinc ions and so we're a little bit here, hydroxide ions. So in these kind of problems, the first thing to do is to kind of like strategize, what is it that we're being asked about here? What is going on here, all right? Okay, so one of the things we have to do is we have to find out what is the KSP for this equilibrium? So KSP would be 
concentration of zinc ions times the concentration of hydroxide ions squared, right? Because there's two of them here. And we had to look up that value somewhere. Now, in an exam, of course, they would give you what the KSP is. And I think what I have here is three times 10 to the negative 17. I don't know where that number came from. I must have copied it from somewhere, but that's what I have in here. So that means that in a saturated solution, in other words, in a solution where this compound begins to precipitate, the product of these concentrations has to be three times 10 to the negative 17. So the question is, if, let me scratch this out of here, sorry, I, I guess I uh, printed the wrong sheet here. If, the concentration of zinc ions right now is 0 0.0010 molar. In other words, uh, 1.00 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. What would be the concentration of hydroxide ions required? In other words, if this were a system where you have the perfectly saturated solution, there's a molarity of OH minus that keeps it in there. Anything beyond that will precipitate. So we want to find out what's the threshold. So we're going to say, well, the hydroxide concentration we need would be like 3.0 times 10 to the minus 17 divided by the concentration of zinc. 1.0 times 10 to the minus third and square root of that because don't forget the concentration of our hydroxide has to be squared all right so if we solve that uh it comes up to i don't have my calculator with me but 1.7 i had to look it up i left it upstairs sorry times 10 to the minus seven molar Okay, in other words, if I'm adding ammonia to generate hydroxide ions, this is the minimum amount of hydroxide molarity that I can have in order to you know, cause a precipitation of zinc hydroxide. If anything is smaller than that, it's not gonna be enough. It's not gonna precipitate. So the question now is, well, how much hydroxide ions can I generate, right? Well, let's go ahead and write out our equation again here. Uh, I guess I lost track of where the paper is at. Bring it over here. So NH3 plus water gives me ammonium and hydroxide ions. Okay, where are we starting? Uh, careful, careful, because we have seriously diluted the ammonia, right? Mm. Let me move this over here. Man, I had it all so neatly set up upstairs and now I gotta swing around. Okay, what is the molarity of the ammonia? Well, remember, we added 2.0 milliliters of a solution that was 0 0.60 molar. Put a line here. And we diluted into one liter. I mean, technically it would be 1.002 liters, but I mean, it's basically one liter. Okay, so we have to calculate what that is, and it comes up to be um, about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, or 1.2 millimolar. And of course, we start our ice table with nothing here. 
Now we're going to see how much of it changes. Uh, okay, let's do this. Let's say, since this is a base, we're going to use a letter Z here. Right? And that means that at equilibrium, we're going to have 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 minus Z. And then we'll have Z molar in all of these guys. The standard ice table, right? So KB would be C squared over 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 minus Z. Eh, we're going to approximate this because we assume that ammonia being such a weak base and being so low in concentration right now, this is probably not going to be very significant. We can check it later if we want. So we'll say this is approximately Z squared over 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. And we got to look this up. The value of the KB of ammonia is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Oops, I lost track of my page here. Over here. There we go. So the value of a Z would be square root of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 times 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. And... Uh, close the parenthesis. Again, I sorry, I don't have my calculator, so I'm going to copy what I have here. Uh, what I have here is roughly about 1.5 times 10 to the negative 4. And don't forget, Z is the concentration of hydroxide ions in here, right? So this is equal to All right, so that is the concentration of hydroxide ions that this amount of ammonia is going to produce in this solution. Since we have uh, to uh, a minimum, okay, since our target is 1.7 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. And this number is much bigger. That means that, oops. Yes. Zinc hydroxide will precipitate. So this is an exercise that is somewhat similar to some of the things we've done before, right? Where you are given a system and it's not explicit as to what is it that you're looking for. So you have to kind of like build the strategy and kind of understand what's going on. So in this case, we had to understand, number one, what is the purpose of the ammonia to produce hydroxide ions? what is the potential precipitate we had to figure out which of these combinations would give me a potential precipitate we landed on zinc hydroxide and now the question was well how much hydroxide do i need in order to surpass the concentrations that are present in a saturated solution so that i'll be quote unquote super saturated and therefore i'll have a precipitate from there on out, it was a matter of building our ice table and finding out if enough hydroxide ions were being supplied. Okay. So uh, once more, that is a uh, ex typical exercise that uh, you probably will not see in the exam. <laughs> Don't worry about it. But it's something you should be able to uh, carry out. Okay. Uh, let me leave you there for a few more seconds. And uh, again, I'm sorry, I can't seem to be able to. You know what? Let me just. 
Let me just zoom out of here. There we go. There you can see the whole thing in all its glory. Over my next nice Mexican table here. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I will have this scanned and it'll be available with the video uh, when you download it. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to join the first part of the session with this one. Uh, I have some limited you know, video editing software, but I think I can merge, uh, kind of like splice those two together. Okay, let me know if there's any questions about this exercise. Cool. Okay, let us go to the next uh, step in our progression here. All right. Um, last time we saw that it is feasible to change the solubility of an insoluble compound if one of the ions is susceptible to the pH. Well, it turns out, and this is something you have already seen in our labs, it turns out that many of our compounds actually are able to be solubilized because the cations are capable of forming what is called a complex ion, all right? So a complex ion is an ion that contains a central metal cation that is bonded to one or more molecules or ions. Now, the nature of this type of bonding is something we'll study in our last topic of the semester. But essentially what it is, is a Lewis acid-base reaction where the metal cation acts as the uh, Lewis acid that accepts electrons. And then these other molecules or ions provide the electrons in the form of what's called a Lewis base. For example, the cobalt two ion, if you put it in enough, in a solution that has enough chloride ions can form a cobalt chloride complex that is soluble. This is an equilibrium system. And what you can see is that if you have just simply cobalt, let's say cobalt nitrate in water, you have a slightly pink solution. And I don't know if you can see the color there on your screen, but this is a slightly pink solution. And if I add HCl, in other words, if I provide chloride ions, I end up with a solution that is blue. This is the solution that has the cobalt chloride complex. Notice that actually the aqueous cobalt two ion also exists in the form of a complex. There are six water molecules connected to that cobalt central atom. But again, we don't typically write that out. We just write it the way it's in that equation that I just show you here. Now, this is gonna have an equilibrium constant and we're gonna call it the formation or stability constant, Kf. And of course, the constant would be products over reactants. And as you can see here, the expression once more tells you the relative ratio of the complex to the component ions that are used to make it. What's interesting about these types of formation constants is that typically they have fairly large values, all right? As that value increases, what's gonna happen is, of course, you have a more stable complex. In other words, the equilibrium would be uh, shifted more towards the right side, in other words, towards the product, which is the complex ion. As I was saying, these complexes have very high values. You can look at this table here and you can see where they all range in the times 10 to the positive exponents. So it's a very interesting thing. Like for example, earlier, if you look at the bottom of this table here, you can see where if you have sufficient hydroxide ions, instead of forming the precipitate of zinc hydroxide, you actually end up forming a complex ion that is soluble. In your uh, experiments that you did earlier in the semester, both physically in lab and now the virtual ones, uh, you have seen how we use the formation of these complex ions to take a precipitate of a cation and then resolubilize that cation and therefore separate it from other ones. 
Uh, let's look at one particular guy here, and that is the formation of the complex between silver ions and ammonia. All right, so let's look at this. Let's say that I start out with the mixture of, let's say, silver nitrate and sodium chloride. Now, you know from our uh, analysis of group one ions that what this is going to do is it's going to start precipitating silver chloride, right? Eventually, you're going to have a full precipitate of silver chloride in there, right? So we learned this in our analysis of group one ions. But here's what's interesting. You remember in that experiment where once we had filtered the hot solution so that we had the silver chloride and the mercury one chloride in the, in the filter paper, we washed it with ammonia. And we said that in the filtrate, we were going to have redissolved silver ions. Well, let's do it in here. Let's go ahead and start adding ammonia to this mixture here. What we notice as we add ammonia is that the precipitate starts dissolving until eventually there's no precipitate anymore. So what happened here was that our initial equilibrium, which was silver chloride in solution with silver and chloride ions, and there's a KSP value for it, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10, for example. What we can see here is that uh, in the presence of ammonia, there is a complex being formed with the silver that has a constant of 1.7 times 10 to the 7. So think Le Chatelier. That bottom equation is shifted towards the right, right? In other words, in that equation, the right side dominates. So what's happening is whatever silver ions are in solution are going to get pooled into that soluble complex. As silver ions are pooled from that uh, bottom equilibrium, Le Chatelier says that therefore the concentration of silver ions in the top equilibrium is dropping. And by Le Chatelier, that means that that top equation is now starting to shift towards the right, in other words, towards the soluble ions, all right? Okay, so that's how it works. So we can see therefore that if we have a precipitate of a particular cation, we may be able to find a uh, agent that it will form a complex with and we can resolubilize that ion from that precipitate. So let's go ahead and do this exercise here. So we have here four different compounds, all right? And I'm gonna test them against cadmium sulfide, all right? So cadmium sulfide is one of those uh, sulfides that uh, we precipitate uh, either in the analysis of group two or group three ions. So the question now is, if I were to add, let's say lithium nitrate, will it increase the solubility of cadmium sulfide? So the question I'm asking essentially is, Will the nitrate ion that I'm bringing in form a complex with the cadmium ion? Okay, let's look at, oops, sorry. Where is the table that I had? Oh, I guess it didn't update. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, what you would have to do is, I'm gonna come back here uh, briefly. Hold on a second, please. Let me, uh, oh gosh, this is embarrassing. I had set this up so you could see that table. Uh, Tell you what I'm going to do here is let's do this. Uh, well, I guess my PowerPoint did not properly update. And so I am looking at squat here. Anyway, what you're going to do is you're going to go back. I'm going to very quickly scan back. Okay, quickly come back here. Oops, sorry. Okay, here we go. We're going to look at this table here. And what we're going to look for is, is there a complex that can be formed between cadmium and nitrate ions? Just look here on the right, on the left side. These are the complexes we have for cadmium. Oops, I kind of went too far. Sorry about that. Let's go back. 
So we're looking essentially at these guys here. And as you can see, there is no cadmium nitrate complex there. So what that means therefore is that no, lithium nitrate is not gonna be able to form a complex. Let's look at the next one, sodium sulfate. Question. Can cadmium and sulfate form a complex that will cause the cadmium ions to solubilize? Okay, look again. Again, on that left side, where we had the cadmium. Again, no such thing, right? So that means that no, no complex will be formed between cadmium and sulfate. Next one is KCN. Okay, let's go back to that table. Again, let's look at these guys here. What do we see here? Ah, look at that. There is a complex ion that can be formed between cadmium and the cyanide ion with a very high KF of three times 10 to the 18th. So therefore that means that if I add this compound potassium cyanide, the CN ion and the cadmium ions are gonna form a complex and that is going to cause the cadmium sulfide to dissolve. So this is the complex that is formed, okay? So that's how you use that table. No need to do any quantitative stuff, okay? Just qualitatively, if I give you a table of complex ions and I ask you this kind of question, just locate and see which of the complex ions could be formed and if not then, it won't work. Let's look at the last one, sodium chlorate. I think it's obvious from looking at the table here on the left side, cadmium would not form a complex with the uh, chlorate ion, ClO3, and so therefore no complex is formed, okay? Um, so uh, the last thing I wanna talk about, and this is just basically, I'm gonna just browse through this, is the idea that all of these reactions of solubility have a final application, and that is exactly what we've been doing in our labs, right? Since we started doing the analysis of group one and group two, and now this next weekend, you're gonna be doing groups three and four. It's all, as you remember, it's essentially a sequence of adding reactants that cause selective cations to precipitate, and then, adding other reactants that cause selective ions to become dissolved again. And that is essentially, I'm gonna skip that part there about the hydroxides, and that is what we call qualitative analysis. So let's say I start out with a mixture of cations A, B, and C here on the test tube on the left, and then I add a reagent that precipitates only cation A, all right? So cation A has now gone to the bottom of this. I centrifuge, I decant the liquid, and now I'm left with cations B and C, right in the middle test tube in there. Now I add a second precipitating agent, and this one will precipitate exclusively B. And so I end up with a fourth test tube that has the B precipitated and the C remaining in solution. If I decant that liquid, I now have C. So I have sequentially separated uh, cations A, B, and C, and of course, what I use is I use this type of technique to separate the cations. Afterwards, I will do a confirmation reaction, kind of like the ones that we've done in lab, okay? Uh, this is a schematic of something similar to what we have done. Uh, so let's say you were to start with an assembly with a mixture of all kinds of ions. Remember that we numbered these guys into groups one, two, three, et cetera, right? Uh, our first group was those that form insoluble chlorides when you add HCl, right? Uh, then you have the group that precipitates as uh, sulfides in acidic solution, that's the group two. Then the ones that form sulfides in uh, basic solution. And then uh, here they have a different format. They use precipitation of phosphates for group four we're not gonna use that. Uh, we're gonna be using carbonate as the precipitating agent. So that is the activity you're gonna be doing this week, okay? All right, so I think that's pretty much as far as I'll go. Uh, there are some ions, I don't know if you noticed there, the alkali metals 
that really do not precipitate with anything. So essentially you had to look for other tests and some of you might remember in Chem 1A, we did the flame tests. And because of the different, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, configurations of electrons in these atoms, there are possibilities that when you add energy in the form of say heat to some of these ions, there are transitions of electrons that result in the emission of photons of specific frequencies. In other words, different colors. So for example, lithium, if you uh, expose it to a flame, will produce a red flame. Sodium will produce a bright yellow or orangey kind of flame. Potassium will give us typically like a purplish bluish kind of flame. And copper gives like an aqua green kind of color or something like that. So if you guys were in lab, you would be doing some of these. It's kind of fun to do this. Uh, but uh, we were going to be doing it. And as a matter of fact, for this particular exam, I am essentially not counting this section here because you guys have done this in lab and I'm more interested that you learn the stuff in lab, not have to study it all over again for the test, okay? So um, that's about as far as this topic goes. And again, I want to apologize for the interruption that we had and for some of the glitches here with our internet. I'm really sorry, but hopefully uh, that was clear. Just rest assured that pretty much everything that we talked about in this lecture right now is not gonna be included in the exam other than qualitatively remembering that one way that you can increase the solubility of an ionic compound is by throwing in a compound that has a molecule or ion that can form a complex and that helps solubilize the uh, cation in question. All right? <sighs> okay. Uh, okay, that was stressful enough, but here we go. Okay, let me know if there's any questions about the topic in, uh, itself. Uh, we're gonna take a break now. And then after that, we're gonna come back and just basically have a brief review of the, uh, for the exam. And hopefully I can find those missing files that I said I was gonna show you. Uh, okay, so let me know, are there any questions either in the chat room or just raise your hand or unmute your microphone and ask me? <clears throat> okay, uh, it looks like the internet is working now. I haven't heard any more complaints. No? Okay, guys, well, let's do this. Let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, and when we come back, we are gonna just go through a quick review. And uh, I have a PowerPoint for it, but uh, I'll make it available to you later if you want. It's really not that big a deal. Uh, I would prefer if you guys just don't have that PowerPoint with you, but I guess some of you guys are obsessive about these kind of things. So I will make it available later, okay? So here we go. We are going to essentially uh, stop our recording now. <clears throat>